Welcome to the OncLive Peer Exchange Educational Series, Challenges in the Management of Breast Cancer. I'm Debu Tripathi, Professor of Medicine and co-leader of the Women's Cancer Program at the University of Southern California, Norris Comprehensive Cancer Center. Today's panel discussion will focus on the treatment of patients with breast cancer, both in the early and advanced disease settings. These videos can be found on OncLive.com. I have the privilege of moderating today's panel of leading experts uh, and frontline practitioners. Our discussion will focus on a range of relevant issues and challenges, including what is new in the diagnosis and management of early stage breast cancer? How can we improve the management of advanced metastatic breast cancer? How will the future of breast cancer care and the progress of personalized medicine be affected by changes arising from healthcare reform? I am joined today by Dr. William Gratishar, Professor of Medicine in the Division of Hematology and Medical Oncology at the Feinberg School of Medicine of Northwestern University in Chicago. Dr. Joyce O'Shaughnessy, Co-Chair of the Breast Cancer Research Program at Baylor Salmons Cancer Center in Dallas, Texas, and at U.S. Oncology. Dr. Christy Russell, Associate Professor of Medicine at the Keck School of Medicine at the University of Southern California and Director of the USC Norris Breast Center in Los Angeles. And Dr. Linda Vadat, Professor of Medicine and Director of the Breast Cancer Research Program and Chief of the Solid Tumor Service at Weill Cornell Medical College in New York City. We will start off by uh, discussing uh, topics in the area of early stage breast cancer, focusing on HER2 targeted and hormonal therapy in early stage uh, breast cancer. So I would like to begin with discussing the current role of HER2 agents in early stage breast cancer and discussing the base of evidence and focusing on some of the controversial areas. One area that comes up quite a bit in today's practice is management of smaller cancers, the T1 and 0 breast cancers. And perhaps, Joyce, you can shed some light on, on where we stand in managing these patients. Well, I think, you know, the adjuvant uh, trastuzumab trials enrolled the T1CN0. So I go by the NCCN guidelines for the T1CN0, so that's TCH or an ACTH. Um, I think the troubles come in more with the T1 A's and T1B's, and the NCCN guidelines say T1BN0, go ahead and think about it, you know. Then I think we kind of say, well, what about those indolent triple positives, you know, that are ERP or HER2 positive strongly, so, you know, they all need chemotherapy and a year of trastuzumab, but now the ERP are negative, um, uh, HER2 positive, no negatives, higher grade. I think I'd be inclined to give those patients chemotherapy and trastuzumab. I, I give serious consideration for the T1Bs, and I probably really do. I don't really do the T1As. You know, the NCCN guidelines really say, you know, really just go with endocrine therapy alone if they're ER positive. Now, I don't know how you guys feel, but I usually go with four cycles. If I'm going to go with a T1B, and I'll go four cycles of Slayman TCH is probably the most common. Steve Jones's data on the dose of taxol cyclophosphamide with the year of trastuzumab is an option. The Dana Farbers led that study with the weekly paxil, paclitaxel. I personally think any of those is reasonable, although we haven't seen efficacy data yet from the um, uh, Faber study. We have seen excellent, you know, the T1BN0 from Steve Jones's study, median follow up three years, zero of 100 recurrences. Now that's only three years follow up, but still. So, um, generally speaking, now I will say that if somebody's a strong triple positive, indolent disease, grade one, grade two, low, low CAS 67, I don't always feel obligated to give those patients a year of trastuzumab and chemotherapy. But generally speaking, you know, I'm, a lot of the HER2 positives are more weakly ER positive, you know, maybe a little higher grade, uh, higher CAS 67. I'll usually give those patients. It really boils down to what is their risk, too. You know, what is their risk? And it's probably at least 10%. Some series will say up to up to 20%. We don't have great data on that, what is their risk, but it's probably in that, in that neighborhood. Anybody using hormonal therapy alone with uh, trastuzumab for low risk? I've just done that in patients that are elderly or it's, I think that they have enough of a risk that I wanna give them something, but I really don't wanna subject them to the chemotherapy. So I think I've been mostly doing it based on age uh, more than anything else. I find the confusing group, the group that have extensive DCIS in many areas of what are called microinvasion. It's, tried, it's very difficult to understand really the extent of invasive cancer in, in that circumstance because you can't really add up all those different sizes and, and that's the group I find the greatest challenge with. 
Yeah, those are the group actually that I tend to be a little bit more aggressive with therapy just because, you know, as you know, the HER2 positive subtype, those are the patients who relapse. You know, when we, you know, used to talk to our patients before we knew that HER2 new positivity was an adverse progno a poor prognostic sign, you know, we would always say, well, you know, there's a 10% risk of tumor coming back and it's probably, you know, this this group, you know, when you when we used to base it just on size. Mm -hmm. The, the other area that, that um, has recently uh, uh, been brought up uh, with some new data is the optimal duration of trastuzumab, uh, studies looking at different durations. Christy, uh, you want to get us up to date on where we stand today? Yes, all the you know, major U.S. trials all ran with one year of trastuzumab, and, and really the picking of one year was very subjective and not really necessarily based on data to make that decision. And we all became very confused when the Finn Herd trial uh, got published, which was nine weeks um, with the concurrent chemotherapy. And so what we've seen is uh, a series of other trials open, but we knew sitting out there was the HERA trial. And the HERA trial was uh, run through Europe and it was uh, chemotherapy all given first, and then patients were randomized to no trastuzumab or one year or two years. And uh, we've all been waiting for the one versus two year comparison, and it was just presented actually a week and a half ago uh, at the ESMO meetings in Vienna, Austria. And uh, interestingly enough, and I'm happy about this, I guess, is there's absolutely no difference at all between one and two years. Those curves sit right on top of one another, and there's just no hint at all that, um, that, it, that we need to go past one year at this point. Uh, and the other direction, though, are a series of trials that are trying to answer the question, do we have to give the full year? And so there was a trial that was presented at the same meeting called the FAR trial. And uh, that trial was patients, again, for the most part, getting their chemotherapy first. So not a lot of concurrent chemotherapy trastuzumab, but the patients were randomized to one year versus six months. Um, it's a smallish trial. It's a non-inferiority trial. And in fact, it was not able to prove that one year was superior or that six months was non-inferior, but it is certainly trending that way. And I think that the, the presenter said one year continues to be the standard, and uh, Sandy Swain, who actually then spoke to the trial, agreed with that as well. 